Hello, my name is Nora Greninger. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the more common problems we have with ticks in this part of Virginia. I'll only talk during each slide if there's something that needs further clarification on the slide or if there's more information than I was able to fit on the slide. So not every slide has an audio file associated with it. This slide shows an overview of what we'll go through in the presentation. Other clinical signs that people associate with Lyme disease but are extremely uncommon in horses include joint swelling and consistent lameness. So if the horse is consistently lame in one leg or has um, swelling or effusion in one joint, that is unlikely Lyme disease. This is different from dogs and people. Several of the other infections that Lyme disease can cause other than typical Lyme syndrome include noroborreliosis which is an infection of the spinal cord and central nervous system that can cause any sort of neurological signs um, and signs that are consistent with encephalitis, such as instability or ataxia, depression, inability to eat, and head tilt, even seizures, just to name a few. Uh, another syndrome is uveitis, where there's severe inflammation of the eyes, um, which can cause uh, squinting and tearing, cloudiness of the eyes, and lastly, pseudolymphoma, where actual skin masses form uh, at the site where the tick attached, we think, um, and those masses, when biopsied and examined, look a lot like lymphoma. So why is Lyme disease controversial? Obviously, it's a disease of great concern, and we're learning more about it all the time. Without a doubt, we see and treat horses with Lyme disease in practice on a pretty regular basis, and certainly what seems to be on an increasing basis. However, it's probably diagnosed a little more frequently than it actually occurs. And that's not an intentional misdiagnosis, but I want to try to explain why Lyme disease is challenging to diagnose definitively, and why there's so much confusion around it. It's incredibly complicated because they've not actually been able to reproduce the clinical signs that we see with Lyme disease experimentally. So to prove that a disease is due to a certain bacteria or due to a certain thing, infectious agent, you need to take that infectious agent or bacteria, put it in an animal, and cause disease. And they've tried to do this, but been, have been fairly unsuccessful. So researchers at Cornell University, where a lot of the Lyme um, research goes on, took a herd of feral ponies that had never been exposed to Lyme disease and put ticks that were infected with the Lyme disease bacteria on the ponies. In sort of the appropriate amount of time, the ponies all got positive blood work, so all their antibody titers went up, which is what we would normally say, yes, this horse has Lyme disease. But not a single pony actually showed any of the clinical signs that we usually say are due to Lyme disease. So they didn't, weren't hypersensitive to touch, they weren't having shifting limb lameness, um, they didn't have any muscle wasting or poor appetite. So even though their blood work was positive, as if they had Lyme disease, they didn't actually show any of the signs we usually associate with Lyme disease. And then when they went on to treat those ponies with antibiotics, like we do in practice, most of them need their blood work responded to the treatment as if we were treating the Lyme disease. But again, since they weren't showing any signs of Lyme disease initially, there was no change when we treated them with or when they treated them with the antibiotics. So that wasn't very conclusive. Interestingly, what? Um, when later on they did look at some of these ponies post-mortem, um, so the ponies were euthanized for a variety of reasons, 
Um, they were able to find the Lyme bacteria in some of the joints and connective tissue and along the nerves. So, and that is where you would sort of expect to find Lyme bacteria causing problems. So it might be um, a few things. One, maybe the ponies weren't infected for long enough. Um, two, although that's questionable. Um, two, the fact that the ponies were somewhat wild and not really used to human touch made it less likely that they would show some of these more um, nuanced clinical signs that we see in the horses that we deal with on a more regular basis. So um, a beloved sport horse, we might notice more if they're not eating as well or if they're a little sensitive to the touch or have a shifting limb lameness, but it might be harder to find a subtle clinical sign like that in a somewhat wild pony. So that whole first part makes our diagnosis of Lyme disease a little controversial. Second, it's confused by the fact that the main treatment we use for Lyme disease is an antibiotic called doxycycline. And doxycycline is not only an antibiotic, but it also has really wonderful anti-inflammatory properties. So, treating a horse for a month with doxy doxycycline, also is a great anti-inflammatory, means that you're decreasing any sort of inflammation in that body for a month. So, probably some horses or ponies that have some of these vague clinical signs, um, and then also it's challenging to diagnose with a blood test, giving them a month off of work plus an anti-inflammatory for a month makes them feel better, even if they didn't necessarily have Lyme disease. So if they had some muscle soreness from something else or um, some limb soreness from something else, a month of anti-inflammatories and rest makes them better. And so we assume they got better because we treated the Lyme disease, but again, that's really challenging to say. And then lastly, our tests are tricky for Lyme disease because our test is a blood test looking for antibodies to the bacteria. Um, and many horses, especially in this part of the country, have antibodies to the Lyme bacteria because they've been exposed to it. Because anytime, of course, a body, a horses or a humans, uh, ex is exposed to some sort of foreign bacteria, the body makes some antibodies to it so that it's ready to fight off that bacteria if needed. And when they've actually screened um, up in the Northeast US, US, this is a few years ago now, but 62% of the horses were positive for the Lyme bacteria. So it's really hard to say what a truly positive blood test looks like when so many horses have a positive blood test. So it's the combination of these three things. One, the inability to reproduce the disease on a research level. Two, the confounding effect of the fact that doxycycline, our treatment, is also a really good anti-inflammatory and three, the fact that our blood tests are challenging to, to use very specifically, those three things make Lyme disease somewhat controversial. There's an interesting note about the correlation of the increase in incidence of Lyme disease with the deer and fox population. Uh, researchers from the University of Santa Cruz recently published a study describing this. The deer populations have stabilized, but Lyme disease has increased across the northeastern and midwestern United States over the past three decades. And that increase coincides more with shrinking populations of the red fox than with increasing populations of deer. This is because the red fox actually feeds on small mammals, such as the white-footed mouse um, and short-tailed shrews, chipmunks, all of which are small mammals that help transmit Lyme disease bacteria to ticks. So less foxes equals more of the small mammals carrying around the bacteria for ticks. So again, a definitive diagnosis of Lyme disease can really be challenging. So we use a combination of the clinical signs in the horse that are suggestive of disease, the blood results or serology, and the veterinarian's index of suspicion, all to diagnose the disease. The best test these days is something called the multiplex serology that's run at Cornell. It's a little better at giving likelihood of acute infection versus chronic infection versus just exposure to the Lyme bacteria. For more complex syndromes other than just the regular Lyme disease syndrome, such as neuroborreliosis, additional testing has to be done. So for the infection of the nervous system, cerebrospinal fluid analysis can be performed. For diagnosis of the uveitis ocular syndrome, um, they can actually take a sample of ocular fluid and look for the Lyme bacteria in that. And then for the pseudolymphoma skin mass syndrome, um, a biopsy of that skin mass needs to be evaluated for the Lyme bacteria. 
How do we know how long to treat the Lyme disease for? It would be ideal if we could retest the blood work to make sure that the antibody levels are going down in the blood to see that we've had a successful treatment regime. However, this has been shown to be really variable. So in a perfect world, some of the antibodies start to decline anywhere from 7 to 11 weeks after infection um, and then be completely undetectable by four to month, five months after infection. However, um, in that same study where they infected those feral ponies and then treated them and then monitored their blood results, sometimes the ponies' blood work followed those parameters and sometimes they didn't. The blood values never returned to normal. So it's very hard to decide when to retest and how to interpret those values. So generally we use um, the horse's response to treatment, so if the horse looks clinically improved, to help determine when to stop treating. The average treatment time, as I say here on this slide, is 30 days. But again, every horse is different. Pyroplasmosis is the last tick-borne disease I'll talk about in this presentation. It's not a disease that should be present in our area, but it is found in Florida and along the Gulf Coast from time to time. And with the increasing travel of horses, especially down for the show circuit at this time of year, 
and the seemingly increased incidence of tick-borne diseases in general, there certainly could be spread of a disease like pyroplasmosis up to our area at some point in the future. So it's really worth understanding a little bit about this disease. We are fortunate to live in a country where pyroplasmosis is still considered a foreign animal disease. However, just over the border in Latin America and Mexico, it's considered endemic, meaning it's around all the time, and from a very young age, most horses are exposed to that, this parasitic infection. Recently, in the last decade or so, there's been several outbreaks of pyroplasmosis here in the United States. In those outbreaks, they found that the, the parasite was actually spread by blood contamination and the use of contaminated needles in multiple horses, as opposed to finding it spread by ticks. This is good because we have ticks here that potentially could spread pyroplasmosis, but as of yet, there's been no proof that they actually are carrying it and spreading it, which makes it much easier to control the disease in outbreaks such as these.